everybody. I'm Ryan Van Winkle, the Artistic Director of Stanza. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today to talk about VR Bunny Lang as part of our Past and Present series. Uh, I'm here with Rosa Campbell, who is a poet, essayist, and scholar based in Edinburgh, uh, and she's an, a specialist in American women and queer writers, and uh, is the editor of The Miraculous Season, The Selected Poems of VR Bunny Lang. Hi Rosa, thanks for joining us. Hi Ryan. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I'm really excited to delve into this uh, this work. Um, VR Bunny Lang, from what I've been reading, is just such an exciting poet. And I'm wondering, I guess, starting at the beginning, can you tell our audience a little bit about VR Bunny Lang and how did you discover her and her work? Absolutely. Uh, so Bunny Lang, the only way that her name is really familiar to anyone um, at this stage uh, is if you are a fan of the poet Frank O'Hara you might recall that there are poems that are dedicated to a Bunny Lang or to a VR Lang. Um, and these are some of O'Hara's most interesting work. He dedicates a huge amount of poems to various different people. We usually know who they are, but not much was known or is known about Bunny Lang. She generally only gets referred to as his sort of eccentric friend whilst he was at Harvard, occasionally as his muse, which I think is quite an interesting and problematic term. Um, and in reality, she was this completely incredible, uh, strange, definitely eccentric, but um, kind of fireball of a person. Um, she was born in 1924 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, and she died in 1956 at the age of 32, a very early and tragic death. But in that short lifespan, she wrote hundreds of poems, many of which were published in her lifetime, but many more of which were never published in her lifetime. Um, but also wrote, staged, directed, starred in various plays. She co-founded the Poets Theatre, which was the very first Poets Theatre um, in the US. She uh, founded that in 1950 in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and so she had this incredibly varied and wonderful life that was kind of uh, snuffed out very quickly. Um, and I really just kind of uh, became captured by the idea of her. Uh, I thought she sounded so amazing, so kind of um, colourful and fascinating. Uh, and so I started digging. Uh, I went to the Houghton Library um, at Harvard, uh, spent a huge amount of time in her papers, found uh, what I think to be about, about 200, maybe 250 um, unpublished poems that basically nobody had ever really kind of looked at. Uh, there was a posthumous volume of her work in 1975. It's now totally out of print. You can't really, it's very hard to get hold of. Um, and anyway, the, the way it presents her work, we can maybe talk about this a little bit later, but is, is quite particular. Um, and so I just really was desperate to kind of bring her back into the light. Um, and it's actually her centenary year this year born in 1924, uh, and so it seemed a perfect time to work with Carcanet to put out uh, some of these poems that, that people have never been able to see before. Well, that's, that's great. I mean, it's, it's such an exciting thing. And I wonder, do you, do you remember like the first, I don't know, when you first started to realize, oh, there's, there's something here I really want to sink into more than just kind of just reading the poems and enjoying them. Where, where did you get the, the bug, the full on bug? Do you remember the first time you encountered her work? Um, I think actually, so there were perhaps two moments and one has to do with her, her actual poetry and one has to do much more with her kind of personality and the life that she, she lived. So um, in terms of her work, it was when I was actually sat in the archives at Harvard, really not knowing what I was going to find there. You know, I wanted to find out more of her, but I, I just had no idea what, what was there. Um, and I was just leafing through these like, tissuey bits of paper, you know, typewritten manuscripts, and realising that in amongst some quite sort of formalist poetry, which is the stuff that I had come across of hers before, there were these incredibly kind of experimental, slightly avant-garde poems that felt so fresh and so kind of modern. And I remember being sat in the reading room in the Houghton Library, uh, sunlight streaming in from Harvard Yard and just kind of looking at this mass of paper and thinking this I mean this woman's incredible like there is some amazing work and she kept making me laugh so so that's the moment that's to do with an actual encounter with the work itself in terms of when I kind of 
felt like I really fell in love with her as a person. Um, there are various anecdotes about her uh, that focus on the ways in which she was quite an eccentric uh, person. And I think one of the things I love about her is that she's kind of mean. She has this sort of vindictive streak to her. Um, and this comes through sometimes in her work, but in particular in these sort of anecdotes about her life. So the really kind of uh, classic one in my mind um, is that she once apparently dated a, a kind of junior executive um, in Manhattan um, whose name was Stanley. Um, and he in some way spurned her or upset her or something. Um, and so what she did was she had printed a thousand pink labels that said, my name is Stanley and I'm a pig. And she pasted them all around his entire neighborhood in Manhattan. So they're in the, the doorway to his building. They're in his local convenience store. They're in the bathrooms of his offices in Madison Avenue. There's all of this kind of, you know, so everywhere he goes, he sees these pink labels that say, my name is Stanley and I'm a pig. And even more than that, she keeps this up for years afterwards, whereby she will send a postcard to him from wherever she's quite often traveling. And she will send a postcard from abroad with the pink label pasted onto it. Or she will paste it into a book and send it to him. She will get her friends to send him labels. This is years afterwards. And I just think this speaks to an astonishing kind of sense of theatricality, yeah. of drama, of this kind of, yeah, it, it really intoxicating personality. <laughs> right. And the thing that really cemented this for me, because it's like a great story and you think, okay, sure, like, amazing. And then I was in her archives and I am, you know, leafing through stuff. And what do I find? Pink label that says, my name is Stanley and I am a pig. So it's, it was this incredible kind of moment of thinking, oh, that's not just a great story. That happened, and I have the evidence right here, and I'm touching it, you know, and it, it was just this amazing moment of, I suppose, to, to cheesily touch on what this event is called, but it was the past meeting, the present. It was, it was really amazing. I would love to see a picture of that, those labels. I <laughs> have I them. They look really cool. <laughs> I mean, really cool. Uh, and then just such a, the, the, I don't know, the time and dedication and consistency and, I don't know, pure sick pleasure of revenge <laughs> <laughs> it's ludicrous yeah. it is a completely like wild thing to like do sneaking into somebody's oh, i don't know if you snuck if she had to sneak in i know well this is the thing i'm trying to picture her with like a stack of these labels like <laughs> going around his neighborhood and because they're not they're not stickers because i guess this is you know the the kind of late 40s so she's like pasting them with with paste <laughs> with glue <laughs> It's amazing. That's really good. That's really, that's really good. I mean, it's such a... And I was just thinking about um, the idea of muse, which you mentioned as well, which, which when I read it in, in, in your introduction to the book, I was like, oh yeah, that's a little cringe. Because she was so clearly an artist, a fully formed artist in her own right. Yeah. It seemed very reductive to do that. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And I think it's such a good thing to be like, finally have this like collected selected works and and it has new poems and it's people poems that people haven't seen before is that right yes unless they have been in the archives then then i would say probably 80 to 85 percent of the poems in it are, are kind of brand new how'd that feel yeah daunting to be totally honest because you have this sense of i mean i very kindly got permission from her estate her her rights are currently held by um her sister-in-law she was mm married briefly for the last kind of 18 months of her life um, and her, her sister-in-law uh, still lives actually in Cambridge, Massachusetts and was kind enough to give permissions for this book and be supportive about it. Um, but really nobody else was taking on this sense of, I don't know, it sounds so kind of pompous, but like stewarding her legacy in some way, you know, and, and I kind of had this strong sense of if I don't do her work justice, in putting together this collection, then maybe I'm dooming her to another, you know, 50 years of obscurity. Um, and that's quite a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I feel it as a, as a kind of like amazing privilege, but also as quite a, a daunting task. And one that I'm sort of glad is out of my hands now, right? The book has gone to print, I can't touch it. And I am very pleased. And in fact, by the time this comes out, it will in fact be in the world. Um, and so I'm pleased I can't obsess over it anymore because I really spent months thinking, 
this poem versus this poem, you know, I couldn't include everything. It needed to be a selected, not a collected. I don't even know whether you could claim to, to sort out a collected for a poet who is so underknown at the moment and and I haven't been able to follow up all of the places that I think her work might still be in other people's archives or whatever. So it had to be a selected. And I also had to think about, you know, the, the audience and what they're going to want from a poet that they've never, ever heard of. So having to kind of... I hope the work speaks for itself. I think it does. I think, to some extent, maybe it didn't matter what order I put any of the poems in yeah. or which ones I included or didn't include. You know, maybe I could have dropped them on the floor, picked them up again and given it to Karkanet and said, publish this. And maybe her kind of genius would have shone through anyway. I think that probably is the case. However, I still spent months agonizing over it. So. I, think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you have to. I think you have you to. Have to. <laughs> um, maybe we should just let the work speak for itself for a moment. And mm -hmm. if, if you wouldn't mind reading a few poems I would uh, love to. That, that you enjoy. Um, so we were talking about that sort of sense of uh, possible vindictiveness. Uh, and this is a, a very short poem that I think that you can see some of that in. Um, a lot of her poems are untitled. Um, and I decided that was the best way of keeping them. I didn't want to impose titles on them. But following what actually um, her great friend Frank O'Hara's editors did with a lot of his untitled poems, we've just called them poem and then included the first line as well, uh, just for, for ease of, of reference. So, poem. The pines pull up from their needles the white sky covers like a scar the whiter day beyond. At 4pm, they're on their way, asking no questions from the car. The road into the mountain leads up with a thousand signs. The white line wavers and weaves. On a dark road, bounded by autumn leaves, you, your eyes growing anxious in the car, with the curtain ring on your finger. Life is full of error. Yours will not be very deep. Or very long. So what I like about that poem is those last two lines and the sort of real sense of menace that's behind them. You know, this this kind of insult around, you know, this the length of, of life and it's hard to tell who the pronoun is referring to there. You know, life is full of error, yours will not be very deep or very long. Is this a sense of, of self-talking or is this a, a you, you know, a second person who is kind of in some sense, deserving of this sort of scorn. Um, I find it quite a, a mysterious poem, and I enjoy that. That's a great, it's a great line, a little stab at some proverbial Stanley. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. You can't help but imagine Stanley. Um, but I'll also read uh, a poem that is, is less vindictive. Uh, so I think that this is a, a poem that is also actually about uh, a form of mortality. Um, but it's certainly much more uh, self-directed for certain, this one, um, and much more kind of lyrical, but has that same sense of mystery, I think. And again, this is untitled. I think I die within the year. Acknowledge all the chaste formalities of suicide. You'll go nowhere as you were, and if you did, you'd stand by even water shot with hatred, having come there yourself the same. You have to turn. Become, quite simply, something other than you were. So looking back to where you were, shall you say, this was not me, is nothing of identity with what I am, with what I will be. Permit yourself this solstice. Permit deliverance. A little death by skinning, stepping free, taut skin into white skin by, the total anger into recommitment. Honour it by ritual. Fast 30 days. On the 30th day, drink only water. Wear only secret clothing. Speak to no one. Proceed out by moonlight only. Wear only secret clothing is a great line. It's good, it's isn't really it? It's really good. Yeah, it's really good. I can see so much why like you're attracted to it. And also, I don't know, hearing you read it, it just feels very alive. And I wonder, like... I don't know, as a poet or something, maybe, maybe as a poet, like, how does it feel, how does it feel reading the work aloud? 
It feels kind of great, actually, because it's not my own. And <laughs> it allows you to remove a lot of that kind of, forgive me for using this term, but the sort of cringe factor of, you know, that is kind of inherent, even if you're really proud of a poem, even if you think it's the best thing you've ever written, there is something just humiliating about reading it aloud, <laughs> I find. Whereas the amazing thing about working with someone else's work is being able to say, I think this is brilliant. Like, I love this poem and, and I want to share it and I have no kind of sense of um, caveat around that, you know? Uh, I, feel, I feel this kind of interesting sense of camaraderie with Bonnie. I, what's really funny is that I don't even know if she would like me. You know, I have no idea whether we would have been friends. I don't know whether she would hate the idea of what I'm doing here. It's so, it's so hard to tell. Although I do get the impression she wanted to be, if not famous, then certainly successful, well-respected, um, sort of thought of as talented. Um, and so I hope she would like what I'm doing. But I certainly do have a little bit of that sense of, of just wanting to do right by her. And, and I think when I read the work aloud, I'm very aware that I'm not doing it in a Boston accent, right? And she, you know, spent her whole life living uh, in and around Boston, Cambridge. So um, she traveled a little bit as well, but really that's, you know, where she spent the whole of her very short 32 years. And so I wonder, I would love to have a Bostonian read this out because I would love to hear what it sounds like in, in the sort of right accent so that I could really picture her, you know, I'm so aware that, that my voice is probably so different to hers. Um, the other thing I wish is that I wish there was any recording extent of her talking even, let alone reading her poems or on stage. I mean, she was a brilliant actress, but as far as I can tell, there isn't anything. Nothing, so, really nothing. Not as far as I have found so far. Yeah, that's so surprising and disappointing. It's so disappointing. <laughs> I know, I know. So I have no idea, you know, perhaps she had, you know, I have quite a low voice, perhaps her voice was really high. So, yeah. you know, that in a sort of high Boston accent perhaps is just like fundamentally different. So, but who knows? Yeah, we, I guess we'll never, we'll never, we'll never find out. Or, or, uh, Maybe AI can do it. That's horrifying, actually. I, I would not want that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody do that. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, I, I just the contemporariness of it, the, the the feeling of like just vividness and aliveness, and very felt very modern to me. It felt very just authentic. I don't know. Is that is, does that sound fair to say? I think so. Yeah. I think she has an incredible modernity to her that I, again, I wasn't expecting because the only. Um, the only time her work was published before this um, was there was a, uh, a posthumous volume that came out, which her husband um, of the last 18 months of her life put together many years after she died, actually. Um, and he worked incredibly hard to try and get it published. It wasn't very successful. Um, he, in the end, self-published it. And then her friend, who is the novelist, Alison Lurie, um, wrote this kind of reflective memoir on Lang and her life to kind of memorialize her. Um, and in 1975, Random House put these two things together with Alison Lurie. So Alison Lurie's memoir of her and this kind of selection of poems that her husband, the painter Bradley Phillips, um, had put together and transformed it into this book. Um, and it is a, it's a very strange volume because A, Lurie's memoir, brilliant though it is, um, and fascinating though it is, is not interested in Lang as a writer at all. It's very much uh, a kind of portrait of a person. It's not always the most loving portrait either, um, which is interesting and perhaps a good thing. Um, but it takes up about a third of the book. And then there's about 48 poems um, and extracts from her plays as well. And those 48 poems were edited in such a way, I found, going back into the archives, in such a way as to present Lang's work as much more formal, um, much more formalist, than it actually is in the manuscript form. So, for example, 
um, Phillips and the rest of his kind of editorial team um, inserted a lot of punctuation at the end of lines, transformed a lot of lines into being end stopped. Um, they did give untitled poems titles. Uh, there's even a poem that became fascinatingly the uh, title poem of the original manuscript that he was putting together, The Pitch, um, in which he cuts out two stanzas entirely. And these two stanzas are ones that are much more violent in their imagery, much more kind of strange or inaccessible, um, a little bit more kind of avant-garde or experimental. And so this to me, when that was all I knew of Lang's poetry, I had managed to get hold of that 1975 book, I assumed that she was quite a formalist poet. And I was thinking, you know, in what way does she tie into a kind of narrative of the New York school, you know, with this friendship with O'Hara? She was also friends with John Ashbery. Um, and so what does that look like? Why is her work so kind of interested in this much more kind of Anglophile, uh, formalist, sort of slightly small c conservative form of poetry? That kind of doesn't really make sense. Why would they have loved each other's work so much? And, and Frank and Bunny apparently, you know, thought each other was, were geniuses, right? Um, and it wasn't until I went back to these manuscripts and went into the archive and found, oh, that's because that's not really how she wrote. And they picked all of her most formal work and they picked, you know, they, they made these strange editorial choices with punctuation, with the titles, etc. And they sliced and diced it and they did all of this stuff. Um, and so now there's this incredible sense of, to get round to your actual question, yes, modernity, that I think was not there when I first encountered her work. And, and I remember, in fact, feeling slightly disappointed when I first got my copy of, uh, it's called V.R. Lang Poems and Plays, um, the Random House book, and, and feeling a little bit like, oh, she sounded like such an amazing person, but actually this work is a little dry, perhaps, a little stuffy, you know, it doesn't quite feel, have that kind of mid-century American avant-garde feel. It instead has this slightly, you know, kind of throwback 1940s Anglophile feel that I was surprised to find. So I was then delighted when that notion of Lang was proved wrong later. Uh, it sounds like such a good revelation, such an argument for like just going back to the source material and just how wonderful to be in that library and being able to be like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is fantastic. It reminds me a little bit, and tell me if, if you think I'm wrong, but like, it, I feel like that, that's kind of what happened to Dickinson as well at some point, right? Uh, where she was sending her poems out and they were trying to edit them to make it a little bit more formal and a little less uh, uh, avant-garde and interesting. Absolutely, yeah. and I think the resurgence of interest in Dickinson's fragments, you know, and in the the things that were found on the backs of envelopes and, you know, written on kind of tissues and stuff. Um, I think that, that that's a really positive step in kind of Dickinson scholarship and, and shows how much we're kind of limiting our view of certain poets if we only kind of accept a, a, a canonized version of them and, and don't kind of go back to the archive a little bit. Yeah, and it sounds like you made some really important decisions in terms of your curation based on some of that stuff. I hope so. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I think they were important decisions. Uh, it, it has yet to transpire whether they will be the right decisions, but I hope so. At least it's another lens. It know? is. It and, is. And, and it sounds to me authentic. Um, okay, uh, maybe this will be our last question, then we'll hear for a few uh, a few more uh, poems. But mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask, all right, this is a weird one. Uh, if you were creating a dinner party uh, with VR Lang, uh, VR Buddy Lang, uh, and other poets or artists, living or dead, uh, who, who, who would you like to see around that table? And, bonus, optional uh, question, uh -huh. what would you serve for dessert? Okay, this is <laughs> an absolutely brilliant question. Um, so, Lang was actually famous for throwing parties. So, I'm picturing this in her kind of four-story brownstone on Bay State Road in Boston, um, which was her kind of once grand family's slightly, slightly decrepit um, home. And I am picturing, I obviously have to have Frank O'Hara there. I want to see, apparently, uh, someone at one point said that they did a Fred and Ginger routine dancing on tabletops in a cafeteria once. So I think if I could have that at the dinner party, that'd be great. Um, I would also like John Ashbury there because he at one point said that, uh, so 
VR stands for Violet Rani. That was her full name, Violet Rani Lang. Um, and uh, Ashbury called her Violet. And so there's this moment where he says, um, our poems, mine and yours, Frank, are much better than Violet's, whose high-hatted attitude somewhat nettled me. <laughs> and I would love to see Bunny Lang nettling John Ashbury. <laughs> so I would like all three of them. Um, and, and I think I would also take uh, Edward Gorey, the illustrator, who was actually Frank O'Hara's roommate at Harvard, and also incredibly good friends with, uh, with Lang. Um, and who was this incredibly kind of extravagant figure, very similar to Bunny, I think, in terms of an interest in theatrics and costuming. He made a lot of the sets for the Poets Theatre uh, productions. Um, and he sort of used to swan around Harvard Yard in this like huge fur coat um, and with a sort of like beaky nose drawing his strange illustrations. So I, I would like those four, please. Uh, Bunny Lang, Frank O'Hara, John Ashbury and uh, Edward Gorey. And uh, what would we serve for dessert? I think that at one point I remember reading something about Bunny making something strange in a bathtub. So I actually don't care what it is, but I want it to be made in a bathtub. Hmm. A bathtub trifle. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and of course you have to invite yourself. Oh yeah, well, I mean. Goes without saying. Yes, although yeah. perhaps better to be a fly on the wall rather than, because as I say, I don't want to run the risk that, you know, Bunny Lang hates me. Yeah, middle's you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but what an honor. Um, Rosa, this has been such a treat. Uh, would, you, would you close out the session with uh, one more poem uh, from Bunny, please? For sure. So what I'm going to read for you is uh, two sections from a sequence, a long sequence of poems called Poems to Preserve the Years at Home. Um, I think this showcases some of Lang's best work. Uh, I find it incredibly affecting. I find it also very funny and, um, and really shows that, that kind of freshness and modernity we've been talking about. So I'm going to read the very first section and the very last section of 14. So I'm going to skip a full 12 sections in the middle. But Okay. Poems to preserve the years at home. One. First year. Cocktail party. It takes all day to dress. Thinking about it, eat, wash, finally the exquisite touches, employing choice. To this one, I'll wear pale green silk stockings. There'll be nothing but poets there, or the writers of terse short stories. One celebrity, catch as catch can. A green silk handkerchief, too. This is Miss Lang, Miss V.R. Lang, the poet or the poetess. Bynum, would you introduce someone else as this is J.P. Hatchett, who is a Roman Catholic? No. Then don't do that to me again. It's not an employment, it's a private religion. Who's that over there? What do you want me to say then? What an illogical position. This is V.R. Lang, she lives at home. She lives at home, she lives at home. She knows how to play backgammon, no bridge, no canasta, likes to drive in her car, has had two accidents so far, and two poems published this year. Two, the first two, in May, and who cares anyway? Bynum and one other. A hopeless ass who has a bigger car and a nasty fetish about the way I wear my hair. All his girls wear their hair the way I do, I see from snapshots. We'll see about that. Come August, I'll cut it all off and wear it very short. Come unto me, you friends of my childhood who still remain, and we'll try it again. Jack, who still is a contemporary, and Bob, who is good for the movies. Violet always picks the hits, he said bitterly after my last outrageous choice. Letters to friends. I get these continual colds. I forgot to ask, did you pass your reading exams? It's curious. I don't seem to be able to accomplish anything. Everything begun, nothing ever finished. Heaps and piles of waste. How is Keith? Not that I give a good go goddamn. No man is ever going to make me suffer again. Put it in the corner with the unmailed letters. We learn one thing. Simple statement can't afford release. It has got to be something bewildering, complicated, preferably mysterious to the self at time of writing. Woke up at four, muttering aloud, scarlet flavour, drop scarlet, not a bit of crystal, something like that. Peculiar. It affords comfort. No adumbration, then. No journalistic writing. 
that way hell lies, gaping wide open and inviting, saying, come in and forget everything you meant, everything you started eager out to do. No numbers, no lists, no categoricals, no descriptive adjectives. Burn it out, tear it out, attempt no descriptions, talk about flames, suicides, terror in sleep. So that's the first section. The final section is much shorter. I'm just going to finish off with that. So this is section 14 of Poems to Preserve the Years at Home. Before you accept life, make no mistake. Those that can give life can take it back. Those that can bring you to life can take in their taking more than they brought. This since we learned we could eat without appetite. Powers go still, time runs out. God, I am so tired. There is only the black centre in my head to reconstruct, to ache, to take dictation. I never once thought about death before I started to die. Time grows thin. The animal arts are turning from pleasure to pain. I told you everything before you slept and lay awake to bite my tongue which knew, which always knew, that what is finally spoken is no longer true. And you had only listened till I told you. What a, what a perfect poem to end on. Thank you so much, Rosa. And thank you for, for, for the fantastic conversation and the readings and just the incredible amount of work and research you did to put this together. I'm really grateful. And I hope everybody watching at home has enjoyed this. Uh, I know I did tremendously. Uh, the book is called The Miraculous Season, The Selected Poems of VR Bunny Lang. Go and get yourself a copy. Um, thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you again soon.